Before we jump straight into talking about tensors, let's talk a little bit about groups and representations. A group is formally defined as a set of elements with some rule for combining them. We'll write a group as some set G1, G2, etc., where G1 and G2 are elements of the group, and we can combine some GI with some GJ via some rule. In this case, that combination is represented by a circle. In order for a set of elements to be considered a group, there are four requirements that it must satisfy. The first requirement is identity, which demands that there is some element that exists in the group that we call an identity. That element, which we'll abbreviate with E, when combined with any other element, gives us back the same original element. The second requirement is closure, and closure insists that the combination of some element, GI, with any other element, GJ, yields some element that is also contained in the group. We'll write that GI combined with GJ yields GK, and closure demands that GK is an element of the group. The next requirement is inverse. Inverse demands that for any element in the group, there must be some element that also exists in the group that is considered that element's inverse, such that an element combined with its inverse gets back the identity. The final requirement is associativity. Associativity requires that the rule for combining elements of a group is associative. In other words, GI combined with GJ combined with GK equals GI combined with GJ combined with GK, regardless of where I put the parentheses. Now let's take a look at one example of a group. The one we have here is the even integers with addition. In this case, the even integers are all the elements of the group, and addition is the rule for combining those elements. Let's go through the four requirements and make sure that each one of them holds. In order to check identity, we want some number such that any element combined with that number gives back the same element. Let's choose some arbitrary element, say 2. I want the identity to be some number such that 2 plus the identity equals 2. This tells us that the identity must be 0. 0 is contained in the group, and the identity requirement holds. Next up, let's go ahead and check closure. Closure tells us that the combination of any two elements must also be in the group. I'll go ahead and choose two random elements, negative 4 and 8. When I combine them, I get 4, and I notice that 4 is also contained in the group. This actually holds with any combination of any elements in the group, because the sum of any even integers is another even integer. And our group is composed of all of the even integers, so closure holds. Now let's check inverse. Remember that in order for something to qualify as an inverse, the original element combined with its inverse must yield the identity. Again, let's choose some random element. I'll choose 2 and we want 2 plus its inverse to equal 0, because we already defined 0 as the identity. Looks like the inverse of 2 is negative 2. Sure enough, the whole set of negative even integers exists in our group, so the inverse requirement holds. Associativity is probably the easiest one to check. Associativity demands that addition is an associative operation. Notice that if I add 2 plus 4 plus 6, that still equals 2 plus 4 plus 6, no matter where the parentheses are. This is true for any combination of even integers, so the associativity requirement holds. Because all four requirements hold, we can say that the even integers with addition is a group. Now let's take a look at something that is not a group. For example, the odd integers with addition. Let's start by checking identity. Just like in the last example, I'll choose some random integer, let's go with 3, and say that 3 plus the identity must equal 3. This tells us again that the identity must be 0, but we notice that 0 is not contained in this set of numbers. If the set does not contain an identity, it cannot be a group, so the identity property fails. This failure is enough for us to stop and say that this set of numbers is already not a group. But just for fun, let's go through the rest of the requirements and see if they hold or not.
In order to check closure, once again we'll add two integers from the set, say 3 plus 5, and that gives us 8. However, this set of numbers contains only the odd integers and not the even integers. Since 8 is even, it is not contained within this set of numbers. In fact, the sum of any two odd integers is going to be an even integer, so the combination of any two elements from the set is not in the set, so closure is also violated. Third, let's go ahead and check the inverse. Remember that closure tells us that any integer, let's choose 3, plus its inverse equals the identity, or 0. But hold on a minute. We already said that this set doesn't contain an identity, so we can't even begin to check inverse because we don't even have an identity with which to check it. So inverse actually fails as well. It turns out that associativity still holds. Go ahead and check it for yourself if you don't believe me. But because we failed three out of the four requirements, the odd integers with addition is definitely not a group. All right, let's take a quick break. Now I want you on your own to take a look at some of these sets and tell me whether or not they are groups. Remember to go through all four requirements, identity, closure, inverse, and associativity, and make sure that they all hold for something to be considered a group. All right. You should have worked these examples out for yourself, but let's review the answers here very quickly. For number one, you should have found that the positive integers with addition is not a group. In order to add integers, we need the identity to be zero, but we notice that zero is not contained in the set, and thus identity fails. For this reason, the inverse also fails, because we don't even have an identity, so we can't even begin to construct an inverse. For number two, the integers with multiplication does a little bit better. This time, the identity is one, and this does exist in the set. However, we still come across problems with the inverse. We need some number such that any number, a, multiplied by that inverse number equals the identity, which is one. We find that this inverse must be some fraction one over a. However, fractions are not elements of the group, and inverse fails. Next up, you should have found that the rational numbers with multiplication is a group. Keep in mind that any rational number can be written as some fraction a over b. Again, with multiplication, the identity is 1, which exists in the set, so identity holds. The product of any two fractions or rational numbers is also a rational number, so closure holds. The inverse is pretty straightforward. Any rational number a over b can be multiplied by another rational number b over a to yield the identity, which is 1. b over a is rational, so the inverse exists in the group. Lastly, multiplication is associative, so this is a group. Now let's look at number 4. You should have found that the integers under addition mod 12 is also a group. Imagine numbers on a clock. If the clock is at 1 o'clock, adding 12 hours will still yield the clock to be at 1 o'clock. Similarly, 7 plus 12 hours is still 7, and 9 plus 12 hours is still 9. So the identity is 12, which exists in the group. Closure also holds. Because we're moving in a circle, the sum of any two integers in this set will yield one of the other integers in the set. To check the inverse, we want some number plus the inverse to equal 12. This means that the inverse is just 12 minus that number. And because all of the elements of the group are between 1 and 12, the inverse does exist in the group. Lastly, addition is associative, so we can conclude that this is a group. For number 5, you should have found that the imaginary numbers with multiplication fail spectacularly when it comes to being a group. The identity, as in any set with multiplication, needs to be 1. But 1 is not an imaginary number, so it does not exist in this set. Closure similarly fails, because multiplying two imaginary numbers yields a real number, which again does not exist in the set. When we go to check inverse, we can't even begin to look at it, because there's no identity. So now we've failed a third time. Our good friend associativity still holds, but that's about it for this one. Alright, 
now let's take a look at something a little bit different. Up until now, we've only looked at examples of infinite groups, but we can also have finite groups that contain a finite number of elements. The smallest non-trivial group contains only two elements, and we'll look at one representation of that group, which is 1 and negative 1 with multiplication. Once again, we'll check the identity, and it looks like in this case the identity has to be 1. To check closure, I'll check all combinations of all elements of the group. Turns out all the results of these combinations exist in the group, so closure holds. Up next, we have the inverse. By the same process that we've used before, we find that the inverse of 1 is 1, and the inverse of negative 1 is negative 1. Once again, both these elements exist in the group, so the inverse holds. Associativity, once again, just looks at multiplication, or our rule for combining the elements. Turns out multiplication is associative, so this property holds as well. So it looks like all four of our requirements still hold. So 1 and negative 1 with multiplication is a group. Now let's look at a more complicated representation of this same group. This time I'll use two 2x2 two two matrices, 1, 0, 0, 1, and negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1. As with any groups, we want to go through all four properties and make sure that this is still a group. As always, we'll check the identity first. Using the same process as before, we find that the identity is 1, 0, 0, 1, which exists in the group, so the identity property holds. In order to prove closure, once again we'll find all possible combinations of elements in the group. And I notice that all the results of these combinations also exist in the group, so it turns out closure holds. Next up, we'll check the inverse. Once again, I'll use the exact same process as we did in the last few examples, and I'll find that the inverse of 1, 0, 0, 1 is 1, 0, 0, 1. And the inverse of negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1 is negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Both of these elements exist in the group, so the inverse holds. Lastly, associativity concerns itself with our operation, or matrix multiplication. We learned back in linear algebra that matrix multiplication is in fact an associative operation, but go ahead and prove it for yourself if you don't believe me. Associativity, along with all the other requirements, holds. So these two 2x2 two two matrices with multiplication are indeed a group. So what's up with that whole different representations of the same group deal? Well, in order to clarify that, I'm going to create what we call a multiplication table. Let's use our first finite group, 1 and negative 1 with multiplication. In order to construct the multiplication table, I'll list all the elements of the group along the top and all the elements of the group down the side. In each square, I'll write the result of the combination of the element on top with the element on the side. In this example, the order in which we combine elements doesn't seem to be important, but as we work into more non-trivial examples, order will become very important, so it's good for us to focus on that now. The results of this multiplication table are 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. To make this a little more arbitrary, I'll replace all the 1s with the letter A, and all the negative 1s with the letter B, to give me a more general form of the multiplication table following the pattern A, B, B, A. Now we'll look at the second group, which I claimed was just a different representation of the first group. And we'll do the same thing by creating a multiplication table with the two 2x2 two two matrices. Remember that as we combine elements, we're always combining the element on top first with the element on the side second. Once again, we get these four 2x2 two two matrices. And I'll replace all the 1, 0, 0, 1 matrices with the letter A, and all the negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1 matrices with the letter B. It turns out that this group follows the same A, B, B, A pattern as the first group. When we prove that the two multiplication tables are the same, we can say that 1, negative 1, and the matrices 1, 0, 0, 1, and negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1, are different representations of the same group.
it may not surprise you that these are not the only two representations of this group. Another example is the even integers and the odd integers with addition. Writing out this multiplication table, we see that even plus even is even, odd plus even is odd, even plus odd is odd, and odd plus odd is even. This is the same ABBA pattern that we've seen several times before. Now, go ahead and look at these different examples, and I want you to figure out for yourself. Are these groups different representations of this group that we've been working with, or do they belong to a different group? Let's recap. For number one, it turns out that the even and odd numbers with multiplication is not a different representation of this group. Even times even is even, odd times even is even, even times odd is even, and odd times odd is odd. This clearly does not follow the ABBA pattern that we've seen before. For number two, however, the real numbers and imaginary numbers with multiplication is a different representation of this group. A real number times a real number is real. An imaginary number times a real number is imaginary. And imaginary times imaginary is real. For number three, we see the same pattern with zero degree and 180 degree rotations. If we rotate something zero degrees and then rotate it zero degrees again, we still get a net zero degree rotation. Likewise, a zero degree rotation followed by a 180 degree rotation yields a net 180 degree rotation. And lastly, two simultaneous 180 degree rotations yields a net zero degree rotation. It may have surprised you that number four, or just the number one with multiplication, actually is a different representation of this group. If we write out the multiplication table using one twice, and say that a is equal to b, we do get the same ABBA pattern, just a very trivial one. This is what we call a degenerate representation of the group. And in fact, this particular degenerate representation is what we call the identity representation. Right now, it seems a little bit trivial and pointless, but eventually we'll learn that this is actually how we identify scalars.